This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hey there, everyone. This is an extra special episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast. This is episode number 23. But the reason why this is a very special episode is because on this episode, we are celebrating hitting 5,000 downloads of this podcast. And so I really, first of all, want to start by saying thank you to those of you who are new, those of you who have been with this podcast for a while, all of you together are contributing to the success of this podcast and we're broadening the reach Uh, of people who are hopefully joining us on this journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name again is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful, but right now locked down upstate New York, uh, dealing with all of this coronavirus stuff. Now, we're not going to get into that today, but what we're going, obviously, I am dropping this episode outside of my normal uh, cycle of, of putting out episodes. And I'm doing that for two reasons. Number one, we are celebrating, celebrating that 5,000 download mark. But number two, upon reflection, uh, yesterday's podcast uh, that I dropped with regards to um, preparing for a, a, a preparing during a crisis, which was part two of our homestead preparedness series, it was as as I listen back to it, it's very long on theoretical stuff, and to a certain extent, I was and I'm going to use this term. I was preaching to myself. I was I was giving myself a pep talk. <laughs> and you just had the opportunity to overhear me talking out loud to myself as I was saying to myself, Brian, you need to focus. You need to focus on the things that uh, you you know are, are in your control and forget about the things that are outside the bounds of your control. Focus on your needs. Focus on being a producer instead of a consumer. That really was you overhearing me giving myself a pep talk, but it really was short. Uh, as I listen back to it, it was a little short on specifics. And as we are in kind of the throes of this coronavirus thing and all of this uncertainty, and especially for those of us here in New York State where things are locked down tighter than a drum, well, not really that bad, but but you know what I'm saying. There are a lot of people right now seeking for answers. And they are looking for guidance. They are looking for how do I get started on raising and growing my own food? Because that really is the, I think what's drawing a lot of people towards this movement right now is that desire for food security. You know, we're seeing pictures of the shelves in the supermarkets just wiped clean. And I think all of that stuff eventually is going to work its way out. I really do. I, I don't think that um, we're going to see people riding in the streets, but, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, we've seen people brawl over TP, so who knows? But I think the supply chain is going to catch back up and uh, we're going to, to see supermarkets um, back to being fully stocked. But I think this has been a wake-up call for a lot of people. And there are a lot of people who are coming into the homesteading groups and the homesteading forums who are saying, how do I get started in raising and growing my own food? And again, yesterday I was talking about how I was feeling overwhelmed. And I've been doing this for a very long time. And even I last week really was struggling with feelings of inadequacy and just being overwhelmed by the situation. And so I can only imagine how people who are who have never raised and grown their own food how they are feeling right now. And so on this special episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, I am going to give you part 3 in our Homestead Preparedness podcast and we are going to be talking specifically about how raising and growing your own food 
can be a major component of your homestead preparedness. So I'm also going to, throughout this, I'm going to refer you back to certain episodes that I've done in the past because I don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel and tell you things that I've already told you um, if, if you've been listening for a while. And uh, if you're new to the podcast, what I want to do is really quickly, uh, you know, I think, <laughs> and maybe this is just a bit um, pretentious on my part, but I think you should go back and listen from episode number one, because I think it'll get you a feel for how, hopefully, how this podcast has grown and gotten better, hopefully, uh, over time, at least in my mind, I'm, I'm hoping that it has. And if it hasn't, let me know that. Um, if you think I'm skidding downhill, let me know that and I'll try to do a course correction. But uh, this episode is going to be simply charting the course. We're not going to do a homestead uh, happenings because I just recorded a podcast yesterday, so not much has happened from yesterday to today. But today we are going to be focusing on raising and growing your own food. And again, I'll be referring you back to certain episodes uh, just so you can get up to speed as quickly as possible, even though I do think you should go back and listen from square one. So if you are new to homesteading and you are trying to get your, your homestead and you've never thought of it as a homestead, but you now you see it as a homestead, you're trying to get it up to speed, you're trying to become prepared, um, where do you start? Well, I think you need to focus on three areas. And you can't do all the things all at once. If you no, if you've been homesteading for a while, please don't flip this off because I think there may be some things in here that will help you know how to take the next steps. But if you are new to homesteading and you're wanting to raise and grow your own food, obviously a great place to start is raising vegetables. And you can do that through a variety of different ways. There's so many different methods of gardening that are out there. And yes, they some of them have uh, pluses and minuses. But, but folks, I, I don't care. You know, there's some people that are like, you've got to no-till, you've got to do raised bed, you've got to do Ruth Stout, you've got to do Back to Eden. Find what works for you because... It, your situation is going to be unique to you. And I don't want to tell you to use the back to Eden garden method and find out that you live in a small suburban house with a very small backyard and you can't get wood chips. Or maybe you're living in an urban environment and all you can do is container gardening on a patio. So you need to figure out what works with you. Now, I did an entire series with regards to gardening. And this started at episode number five. It went through episode number nine. But in episode number five, I focused on the different types of gardening methods. So that's where I would recommend you start is going back and listening to that episode so that you understand, okay, what, what, are, what are my, um, you know, kind of the boundaries, uh, my constraints, whether it's your land um, all of those kinds of things, and then determine what kind of gardening method might work best for you. And if you have questions about that, you want some guidance, reach out to me. You can reach out to me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com, or you can reach me via our Facebook page or our Instagram account, and I will be more than happy to help you with any of these questions, but in particular, in helping you and guiding you along the way to help you understand what gardening methods you might want to use. Now, as I went through that series, the second step of that series is I recommended that you think about the harvest. And why do I recommend that you think about that before you ever buy a seed, before you ever put a seed into the ground? The reason being is that you need to understand what you should plant and your harvest is going to help guide you in that direction because you want to plant what you eat. If you don't like radishes, then it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to plant a bunch of radishes. If you don't like squash, then don't plant squash. You need to utilize every square inch of space that you have to produce food that you like to eat and food that you're going to be able to, to do something with, whether that's to grow in abundance and trade with other people or to give away to other people, or whether it's going to be that you're going to 
um, can it, freeze it, dehydrate it, ferment it, but you need to think about that. And so we cover that in depth in episode number six. Now, the next thing is, is after you've kind of thought through those things, where should I get my seeds? That's one of the big things that I see popping up on a lot of the homesteading groups. And I'm going to tell you right now, folks, at this point in time, with all of the uncertainty, my advice to you is to get the seeds wherever you can get them. And if that means that you're going to get them at Walmart, buy them at Walmart. If that means that you're going to get them at Home Depot, get them at Home Depot. If that means that you're going to get them at Tractor Supply, get them there. Or order them through a seed company. Now, again, I have a full episode on that, season one, episode number seven. So you might want to listen to that. But one of the things that's really driving me nuts right now, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of a rant here. But what I see is I see people jumping into Again, they're brand new to this. They have no idea where to go, what to do. And they're saying, where should I get my seeds? Or um, is XYZ seed okay? And you have these people that are still stuck on the non-GMO, organic, heirloom, and they're beating that drum. If that's you, please stop. Don't be a moron. Now, that maybe is a bit harsh, but right now, folks, if you've got people, I saw somebody who, who, who had bought, and I can't remember exactly what kind of a seed it was, but you had somebody jump down the throat about, oh, you shouldn't plant that because that came from Monsanto. Give it up right now. We have people, now I understand your love of organic and I, I want to plant as organic as I can. And I understand you know, the, the non-GMO thing, although that's way blown out of proportion. Most people do not have access to GMO seeds, so just stop beating that drum for a while. We have people right now who maybe, and I don't want to blow this out of proportion, but maybe the difference between them having a good diet and going hungry is planting a non-organic, non-heirloom, some kind of hybrid squash or cucumber or whatever that they found at Walmart. I would much rather see people growing those kinds of seeds and not going hungry than beating the drum about heirloom seeds, beating the drum about organic stuff. That's nonsense right now. It goes back to what we talked about yesterday. We need to focus on our needs. And yes, the organic thing is nice. And yes, the non-GMO thing, I get the theory behind it, although it's just a wasted hot air. But right now, now is not the time. If people are worried about food security, they need to do the best they can with what they got. Now, if you want to guide them towards your favorite seed company, go right ahead. But my advice to you, if you are new to this whole thing, my advice is simply to go to your Walmart, Tractor Supply, Lowe's, Home Depot, do it safely, practice the social distancing, but get what you can get and do the best you can with what you can get. All right, wow. Okay, breathe deeply here, Brian. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you might want to think about planting? If you are brand new to raising your garden, you're going. there are certain things that are relatively foolproof. Now, I'm not going to say that you're going to have success every time, but lettuce is relatively foolproof. Uh, leaf lettuce and those kinds of things. Radishes are relatively foolproof. And so those are some things that you can direct sow and you're going to need to understand about your zones and, and all of those kinds of things. I'm not going to get too deep into this, but those are some things that you can plant. Now, I'm not recommending that you plant an entire garden of lettuce for one person, but lettuce is something that you can succession plant. That means that you plant a little bit, and then in a couple of weeks, you plant a little bit more, and a couple of weeks, you plant a little bit more, so that as you begin harvesting, as you get done harvesting the first bit, you now have some lettuce to continually harvest throughout the entire growing season. But that's something that's relatively easy to, and you direct sow it. That means you sow it into the ground. Um, beets are another thing that is fairly easy, fairly foolproof uh, to be able to sow into the ground and to achieve a harvest. Um, onion sets, that's there's a difference between seeds and sets. Onion sets look like little baby onions. You plant them and they grow out to be bigger onions. If you're new to planting onions, I would much I would recommend you go that route and not go the seed route, but it's up to you. Um, but that's something else that can achieve 
um, a good harvest fairly easily. Now, you're not going to live on a diet of onions. I get that. But it is something that it is fairly easy and fairly um, uh, space. You, you, can, you can plant them relatively uh, intensively. And what that means is, is, is relatively close together. So you can get a lot of harvest out of a small area. Um, beans are another thing that I highly recommend. They're relatively easy to plant and easy to, you know, really, relatively easy to, uh, to grow. And they are something that you can harvest the pods or you can let them, if you, you get uh, dry bean varieties or shell bean varieties, you let them go uh, and dry out, and then you're going to have a great source of protein that you can eat all winter long. And so those are some of the things that I would recommend that you focus on. Now, there are some other things that are great, like peppers and tomatoes um, and those kinds of things, but those are things that you have to start indoors. And so you're going to need to have a little bit more equipment to be able to handle that. And it's not hard. Um, there's some great videos out there. I have a video that I put up on my YouTube channel about my grow light system that I put together a couple of years ago, still using it. Uh, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, Jason Smith over at Coghill Farm just dropped a video today uh, detailing his grow light system. So very easy to do. Uh, but it does require a little bit more work, a little bit more space. But then you can start peppers indoors. You can start tomatoes indoors. You can start cabbages, um, cauliflower, those kinds of things, um, and achieve a great harvest. Now, certainly, if you can get your hands on heirloom open pollinated seeds, that is going to be your best option because what that allows you to do is save the seeds from year to year and when you plant the seeds from the, the, the whatever it is, the pepper, the tomato, or whatever, next year, it's going to breed true. In other words, you're going to get the same variety again next year. A hybrid, it's not a bad thing. It's not genetically modified. Don't listen to the people that tell you that because they're wrong. A hybrid simply means is they took two of the same species, so two cucumber plants, and they cross-pollinated them to get a particular characteristic. But if you were to take the seeds from that cucumber and try to plant them, you may not get the same characteristics again. That holds true for any kind of hybrid type thing. Can you plant the seeds? Absolutely. Is it going to kill you or hurt you or injure you in any kind of way? No. But the viability may not be what you um, were anticipating, the traits that it's been bred for. May, may not be there. And so in, in, in des desperate times, call for desperate measures. If all I had were hybrid uh, cucumber seeds left, I would plant them again um, and see what I get. Um, but definitely, if you can get heirloom open pollinated uh, varieties, I would recommend you go that route, but you don't have to, okay? Do the best you can with what you've got. All right, so that's your, your gardening. Now, the second thing that you're going to want to think about is, potentially, is raising meat for your homestead. A lot of people, right away, they go to thinking about chickens. That's certainly an option for a lot of people. And in fact, I just happened to, a couple of weeks ago, complete a four-part series on raising chickens. So if you go look up ep episode 16, 17, 18, and 19, we talk about all kinds of things chicken-related. Everything from what, where to get them, uh, what they need, um, what types of breeds you might want to consider. I have an entire episode, ep episode number 18, on raising chickens for meat and your various options there. So chicken for a lot of people, that's where they start. But not everybody can have chicken. And so you might want to consider getting rabbits instead because maybe you're in an HOA, can't have chickens, but you can raise rabbits on your back porch. Definitely a great option. They're prolific breeders. Tell me how I know. I've learned a lot about bunny math over the years. Not going to get into that whole story, but trust me on that one. We've learned a lot about 
Um, when people talk about breeding like bunnies, there is so much legit legitimacy to that. <laughs> um, but rabbits would be a potential option. Um, and that's something that we've had a lot of experience with here on our homestead. We're not currently raising rabbits. I was going to get out of the rabbit business for a couple of different reasons. But right now I'm rethinking that and thinking maybe I need to just find a buck and get through this uncertainty here. And then maybe later on I'll pivot and go in the direction that I wanted to go. But rabbits would be another great option. If you've never raised animals for meat before, trust me, I I'm not going to lie to you. Um, dressing off rabbits, um, is, is not as easy as dressing off a chicken. Uh, it's just a little bit tougher to do, um, because, uh, you know, we, this cute little fuzzy thing, but it's okay. Those kinds of feelings, and you may be sitting there thinking, oh, Brian, I can't raise, I'm not going to be able to dress off these. You can do it. You may cry. Uh, it may break your heart. But you do it a couple of times, and I, it's not that you become insensitive. I've promised myself if I ever become insensitive to the to the the fact that I am taking a life in order to preserve my own life, if I, if I ever take that for granted, that is the time to get rid of my animals. But on the other hand, we need to understand this for what it is. And these animals are giving of their lives so that you may live. And again, I, I don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. And it may be that you need chickens or rabbits in order to be able to survive. Um, and they are definitely a very, very good source of protein. Another thing that you may want to think about are quail. Now, I, have, I don't have any experience raising quail. It's something that I've considered, haven't gotten there yet. Um, but the great thing about quail is that you get eggs and meat. Now you need a lot more eggs to make an omelet, but you're going to have eggs. Uh, you're going to have meat. And these again are animals that somebody who lives in an urban area could raise. I, I've shared the story before of a guy that I saw who was raising them in an aquarium, in a large aquarium in the middle of his living room. Now, is that optimal? No. But again, it's something that is doable. You may be able to do them on your balcony in the city. I don't know what your situation is, but it is at least an option. And all of those things, chickens, rabbits, quail, are relatively easy things to learn how to take care of. Um, they're small. You don't have to worry about hurting things around or worry about animals that are going to hurt you. Although a rooster could, could beat you up a little bit, but don't be afraid of him. <laughs> Teach him who's boss. Um, but, but on the other hand, it is definitely something that if you've never done this before, it is definitely, definitely doable. Now, if you've been doing all of those things, then maybe you want to step up a level and you might want to think about pigs or goats or sheep. Um, and you know, obviously pigs are going to give you pork, but they're also going to be a great source depending on the breed. We have American Guinea hogs just did an episode about that episode number 20, you may want to think about raising pigs so that you have lard to make soap and lard to fry things in and, and lard to use for baking. Um, that may be something else that you want to think about. Goats might be an option for you to think about in order to ensure that you have dairy. Um, maybe you have done chickens, you're ready to step up to goats, but you're not really able or willing to commit to a family milk cow. A goat might be, or goats might be, a great option for you. And then sheep are also something that might be a good option for you from the standpoint of milk or um, the wool that, that you can get from them so that you can provide for the basic necessity of clothing that we talked about yesterday. Um, and so that might be something else for you to think about. And again, we're just each step that you go up from going from chickens and rabbits and quail, those are relatively inexpensive entry points. You can put together um, coops and, and, and housing uh, relatively inexpensively for chickens, rabbits, and quail. You get up into pigs and goats and sheep. Now you're talking about needing a little bit more sturdy fencing. You're needing um, you know, maybe a barn or housing. Um, and, and so you've got to weigh out all of these things because you can't do all of the things all at once. If you're starting from square one, 
then you're probably not going to want to just jump right in and get pigs, goats, sheep if you've never raised an animal before. I would caution you against that. Get some chickens, yeah? Your diet, if that's what you had to rely on to eat, your diet might be a bit monotonous, but you're going to have a diet. You're going to have food to eat. You're going to have meat. And that's what it's about. And then obviously you can step up that next step to cows for both meat and for milk. In all of this though, you need to be thinking about your feed source. Where am I going to, how am I going to be able to feed and care for these animals? And again, this is something else where for me, and I think especially now more than ever, it, for us, it has been most important to find a local provider of feeds. A lot of people get caught up in the GM, non-GMO and the organic and all of that kind of stuff, and they're having their feed shipped to them from Timbuktu. What happens if you no longer can get a shipment from Timbuktu? Now what are you going to feed your animals. And that's why to me, buying local, having a local supply of these things in order to be able to care for your animals is of utmost importance. And you need to develop those relationships now. You need to understand where you can get those things now and have a backup plan if you're unable to get feed at, um, you know, feed supplier A, what about feed supplier B? Have a backup plan but folks, we've got to get over this. And, and I'm not asking you to compromise your principles. I'm not asking you to do that. But on the other hand, if your option is organic, uh, I'm sorry, if your option is conventional feed or your animals go hungry because you can't get GMO, non-GMO non uh, organic feed, what are you going to do? You're going to buy conventional, right? So you need to think about some of those things because you need to do the best you can with what you got. All right. The third thing I would recommend that you focus on are herbs. Starting a small herb garden for medicinal purposes and for cooking purposes, I think can be huge. It's not something that's extremely complex. Um, you can do, I, I put together a video that I will share with you on um, a simple herb garden to, uh, that we made out of some pallets with some, some pots. That's something that you can do um, so that you have herbs for cooking and for medicinal purposes. Um, at this point in time, folks, in my opinion, this is not the time to think about, unless you've got all these other bases covered. If you've got a great garden plan, you've got a great meat plan, you've got herbs covered, then maybe you want to think about fruit, fruit trees and berries and those kinds of things. But if you are trying to get up to speed and become as prepared on your homestead as quickly as possible, fruit trees and orchards and nuts and those kinds of things, this isn't the time, in my opinion, to be investing in that because that's not going to give back to you for several years. Now, I know the adage is the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time to plant a fruit tree is today. I get that argument. But on the other hand, if we're trying to get up to speed with homestead preparedness and raising and growing as much of our own food as possible, as quickly as possible, and we have limited budgets, limited space, and all of those kinds of things, then the last thing on my mind is going to be planting fruit trees, is going to be planting berries and nuts. Now, if you can eventually get there, great, go for it. But I'm speaking to those people who are trying to get up to speed as quickly as possible with homestead preparedness, particularly as it re relates to raising and growing your own food. So, where do you start? Start with your veggies. Start with the vegetable garden. At the same time, you can also be thinking about getting chickens or rabbits or quail, thinking about those kinds of things. Um, but definitely, and, and, and as I shared yesterday, if I had to choose any time of the year to be under the gun, at least here where we're located in the United States, this is the best time of the year for this kind of uncertainty to come about because now I can revamp my plan. I can plant extra, 
right? I can I can pivot a little bit and maybe some of the things that I, I, I wanted to do, but you know, well, they're not going to provide me with a huge payoff right now. All right, we'll table those. We'll put those on the back burner and we'll focus on the things that are going to give us the most bang for our buck in the areas of our needs that we talked about yesterday. And so again, go ahead and get those veggies started. Think about your meat sources. If there's something that you can do in order to be able uh, to um, raise your own meat. And I think for most people, uh, they can do at least some of that in a very small measure. Again, think about those herbs. You can do herb, herbs in, in raised beds. You can do herbs in containers. You can do herbs in the windowsill. You can do herbs in pots. I mean, a lot of things you can do with herbs, both from a medicinal and a cooking perspective. And uh, finally, you know, if you can get to the fruits, the orchards, those kinds of things, you know, go right ahead. But that is not where I would place my focus. Having said all of that, there are certainly, you're not going to be able to raise and grow all of your own food and, and, and provide all of the needs that you have on your homestead. We talked about that a little bit yesterday from the standpoint of, of salt and wheat and, and those kinds of things. And uh, so you may want to think about putting up stores of, of those, those essential basic type things in your pantry, um, but there's no need to go out and buy those meals that are going to last for 25 years. I would much rather see you invest that money in seeds and in animals and put together a sustainable system. Again, we talk about self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and sustainability. Put together a sustainable system where you can plant vegetables, harvest vegetables, save seeds, and plant those seeds again next year. Where you have a buck and a doe, and you are raising babies, right? And you're dressing them off, and you're either putting them in the stew pot or you're putting them in the freezer. Or you have a rooster and hens, and periodically you're allowing the hens to set and go broody, or you're, allowing, you're, you're, you're putting the eggs in an incubator. And you are, again, you have that sustainable system in place where you are able to begin providing your own meat in a very systematic way. Um, that's a big part of the reason why we have the American guinea hogs, as I shared in episode number 20, because that it's a breed that we, uh, we love because of its docile temperament. And so I can have a boar and a sow and not have to worry about where I'm going to source feeder pigs from every spring because I have a boar and a, actually a couple of sows and I can, I can replenish that if my boar is maybe he's in, it seems like he's blowing blanks. All right. I raise up one of his sons to, to become my herd sire, or I look to somebody else to say, Hey, do you have one that I can bring in? But for a very, very long time, I am able to systematically produce the meat that I need here on our homestead. So folks, I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these steps, um, let me know. I know this is very high level. If you refer to the episodes um, that I talked about, it, we, we jump into the, some of these topics a little bit more in depth. I think they'll be very helpful to you. And uh, But again, if there's some kind of question that you have, something that uh, I didn't answer or something that you disagree with me on, let me know. Uh, again, the email address is the homestead journey podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we are also on, uh, Instagram and we are on Facebook and you can always reach out to me there. And my goal is to help as many people, uh, as I can to be prepared and to have an increasing level of food security in the midst of crisis and uncertainty. As always, the music on this podcast is provided by Audionautics.com, so a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.